week we talked about the Beatitudes, when G- the blessings, blessed are they, that, right? Last, that's what we talked about last week, seeing Jesus as our teacher. Today I want to talk about two things, salt and light. So if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. We're talking about two things. Salt and light. Let's just go ahead and pray, and then, and then I'll get started. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Thank you, Lord, that it's alive. It's for us today, just like it was when you spoke it out of your mouth, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that it has power, and it brings light to us and shows and reveals to us who we are and who you are to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we have ears to hear. We thank you, Lord, that because we're your people, we believe that you are our teacher, our life teacher, and your word has been given to us, Lord, to guide our lives, to direct our lives, and to show us life, light in our lives, Father. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, and this is what Jesus says. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste or its saltiness, that's what, that's what the original language says, it's saltiness. It didn't actually say taste, right? If salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and and it gives light to all the house. In In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So Jesus, he he, he compares his people, he compares you and I to two things, right? He compares us to salt and he compares us to light. He says that you're salt and he says that you're light. Now, Jesus used these two things because everybody could relate to these two things, especially in Jesus' day. All right? We don't, I know, like, we have some islands here that they, they, um, they produce salt, right? I think, where is it? Like, is it in Nagua that they produce salt? Right? But mo- for most of us, we don't know nothing about that, man. You know, we've never seen raw salt, right? We, we don't know. We get salt out of the, the box. We get salt out of the thing. That's what, uh, you know, our little shaker. That's to us. That's where salt, no, but that's not where salt comes from. And so in Jesus' day, Everybody was familiar with salt, what kinds of salt there was, and where it came from. And most of the salt that the people in, in Jerusalem got, they got from the, the Dead Sea in that area, right? And there were, there were also um, places and rock formations that they would get salt from as well. And so Jesus is using something that people could understand, right? He's using an illustration for us that we could understand and that we could relate to, salt, And light, everybody can relate to light, right? We can't live without light. That's light is one of the most relatable things to, to, to human beings. And he says that that's what we are. He said, to the world, to the earth. And so, you know, I, I used to see this scripture in the, the way many other people saw the scripture, and I even taught on it uh, in a way that wasn't correct because I didn't put it with the other scripture in Luke. And what I mean by that is most people, when they teach on the scripture, they teach that you are the salt of the earth, meaning that you are the preservative of the earth or you, you give flavor to the earth, right? Or, you know, because that's one of the, that's one of the um, qualities of salt. It's a preservative. It gives flavor. And not that those things are wrong, but Jesus, is, Jesus actually tells us exactly what he meant when he said you are the salt of the earth. And he tells us in Luke, and I'll, I'll get there in just a second, but... He tells us that we're those two things. He tells us that we're the salt and we're the light. Now, now, I want you to understand because some Christians, when they read this passage, they don't read it the way Jesus said it. They hear it differently. Like, have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you say something to them, but they, hear, they heard something else? We all have had that, right? None of you guys? None of you guys have said something to somebody and they heard it in a totally, totally different thing than you said? We've all done it. Right. So a lot of times when Christians hear the, this, this 
Scripture, this is what they hear. Be like the light. Be like the salt. Right? A lot of times when Christians hear these two verses that Jesus, you know, when he tells us that we're the salt, we're the light, they don't hear you are the light. You are the salt. They hear be like light. Be like salt. But that's not what Jesus said. He said you are. That's a big difference. Because one, one, one way of thinking is that he's telling me to do this or he's telling me to, to act like this or he's telling me to have these attributes. And, but what he's actually saying is you are this. You have these attributes. This is not what you're trying to be. This is what you are. And so we need to, we need to understand clearly that, that Jesus is not telling us necessarily what he wants us to do. He's telling us what we are, and it's very important for us to, to see that because a lot of Christians off the bat don't believe that they're the light of the world. And they don't believe that they're the salt of the earth. They actually, they don't believe that about themselves. They believe that, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus is, Jesus is the light, but me, I'm, I'm not the light. I don't need to shine because I'm just old, I'm little old me. I, I'm not really necessary, I don't have anything good to offer the world. But when you became Jesus's, or, or when you became God's own possession, God said that you have something to offer the world. Believe Jesus. Believe what the teacher says about you. He says, this is what you are now, right? So I need to get that. I am the light. Say this after me. I am the light. I am the salt. That's what he says you are. So get that in your mind. That's what you are. That means that you have a purpose. How many know light, we need light and we, we need salt. And for more reasons than, than we know, right? So we need to understand that this is not what he's telling you to do. This is what he's, what he's telling you that you are. You are these things, he's saying to us. And so they, they, they affect things just by being what they are. They have an effect on things that, that, they are, that they are near or they're on because of what they are, not just because of what they do. Now, Jesus, I want you to go, if you have your Bible, go to me, go with me to Luke chapter 14, and we're going to find out exactly what Jesus meant when he calls us the salt of the earth. Because like I said, many Christians, like I hadn't in the past, I didn't put this scripture together with the other scripture. And so I... Not that the, the attributes that I thought about that salt had were wrong. It was just that I did not use the specific attributes that Jesus spoke about salt having in this teaching. Okay, Luke chapter 14. And verse 34. Luke 14, 34. Listen to what Jesus says. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, so he's referring to the same virtues of salt or its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile, or the, the King James says the dunghill, right? It is thrown away. And then Jesus says, which is so important, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So now in Luke, Jesus is telling us the uses of the salt, right? Specific uses that he wants us to understand in, in Matthew. He, he's not just talking about all the general uses that we have for salt, because salt is used for many different things. In Luke, Jesus is telling us the specific uses for salt. When he refers to us as the salt of the earth, this is important. Okay, what did he say? He says salt is good, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is, it is of no use either for two things. He's telling us the two uses for salt when it, when it comes to us being the salt of the earth. He says one, for the manure pile or the dunghill, and two, for the soil. Okay. Now, any Jewish person would have understood what Jesus meant when he referred to salt being of no use for the soil 
or the manure pile. Now, in Israel, from the salt sea, there, were, there, there are different kinds of salt. Like certain salt, certain kinds of salt had different minerals in them. Some had like phos, phos, uh, phosphorus, some had nitrogen, and some had something that they call potash, right? And different, they had different, degree, different uh, you know, minerals, different kinds of salt. And so the, the kind of salt that had the potash in it was the salt that they would use for fertilizer, right? So when, when he says here it's not good for the soil, he was speaking of fertilizer. Now, well, we know what fertilizer is for, right? What do, you, what do you use fertilizer for? You use it to cause your plants to grow. So in the context that Jesus is calling us the salt, he's not talking about taste. He's talking about fertilizer. And fertilizer in the sense that salt is used to fertilize the earth to bring forth life from the earth. Remember Jesus said you're the salt of what? The earth. And in the context he's using the salt, he's saying you are the fertilizer of the earth. That's what they use it for. Like I said, if you talk to any Israelite in Jesus' day, they would have understood exactly what he was talking about. But we don't do that today. So when we read that, we think, oh, he's just talking about what we use salt for, mostly, which is what? So that my food can taste good. But that's not the only thing salt was used for. It was used to fertilize the ground, the, the dirt, so that when you planted um, your crops and, and, and whatnot in there, it would, it, would be fertilize, it would fertilize it and you would grow crops. You'd be able to grow it, but it would be able to produce life and bring change. And he's saying, that's what you are to the earth as a believer. N notice what he's saying. You, he didn't say that's what you're supposed to do. Because remember, he said you are the salt. When you take salt and you put it on the food, you don't say to the salt, now salt, I need you to make the food taste good. Right? You don't, that doesn't, that's not how it works. As long as you put it on the food, it's going to do its job. As long as you put it on the earth, it's going to do its job. As long as you put it there. So what Jesus is telling us about, what, what Jesus is talking to us about, he's, he's not talking to us about being salty. He's saying, make sure you go into the earth. Make sure you spread yourself out among, just like that missionary that we just watched. Right? Him and his congregation, and it was amazing because I don't know if you know about the Amish, but he grew up Amish. Now he came, he got out of the Amish church. Like I told you, that's not the whole story of the documentary. But he grew up Amish, and he left the Amish because when he got saved, one of the big problems that he had with the Amish church was the Amish, the Amish people, they don't believe in preaching the gospel. They make their own communities, and they exclude the, they excluded from the world. They, they could care less about the rest of the world. They want to stay holy. They don't want the world to come and touch them and affect them. But their mission is not to go out into the world. And he had a call from God and he had a desire to be what? Salt to the earth. He had a desire to go where there was no salt, where there was no life being produced in the earth to take what he had and to bring it there. And that's exactly what he did. And so as salt, our responsibility is to make sure that we are in the world, affecting the world, and producing life in the world like as fertilizer. We need to understand that's our, call, that's our calling. That's, that's not something that is optional for the believer. And that doesn't mean that you have to, you have to cross the ocean or get in a plane and go to a country that, 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 that no, that where nobody's ever heard the gospel. That's in your job. That's in your workplace. That's wherever you are. You're to be the salt. What makes salt so different from everything else? It's, it's, it has a distinctiveness, right? When, whenever salt is applied, it changes because its nature is different from everything else. Its nature is very different from everything else. And we have to understand that we're here. We're, Jesus calls us the salt of the earth because we're to be the fertilizer. We're to produce life in the earth. We're to go to those parts of the earth where there is no life and fertilize it and bring forth life. That's, that's what we're called to do. Now, the second thing that Jesus said that the salt is, is, good, would be, would, is, is used for is the dunghill. Now, he's not talking about, a, when he says the dunghill, the, the way that back then people would use the bathroom is 
<laughs> very different from the way we use it today. Okay, they didn't have toilets, they didn't have running water, they didn't have pipes in the ground, they didn't have any of that stuff. So when they would go to the bathroom, there would be a pile of it. Okay? And so, you know, that, that wasn't very sanitary. And so one of the things that they would use salt for was they would, they would put salt on that pile and it would kill the germs and stop the spread of any disease or any germs that would be produced in that pile. And so Jesus said that the second thing that he was saying to us, the second thing that salt does is what it prevents the spread of germs, right? And for, for us in, in our world, what is he saying? It, he's saying that where we go, we prevent the spread of evil. We, pre we prevent the spread of wickedness wherever we go. You know, when you see, and I'll use the Bahamas because we're here, and this is a great example, you know, I, I hear older people, older Christians say, I've heard many of them say, you know, when I was growing up, it wasn't like this, you know, things weren't the way it is, and things weren't as bad as it is, and things were different, and people have respect for one another, and blah, blah and they go on and on and on, and you know, in, in the back of my head, and I've said this to one or two of them, I said, you know what, the reason why that, why, why it's gotten worse is because the church just pulled back. Is because the church stopped going out and preaching the gospel like they used to. How many was around? I mean, I've heard the stories that, that people used to be all over this nation in every neighborhood almost preaching the gospel throughout the week. They would have Bible studies and open air meetings. How many, anybody know about that? Anybody heard about that? I've heard lots about it. How often do you see that now? So, so they're, they're complaining about why iniquity is... Is, is multiplying and sin is multiplying, but they don't understand it's because they have stopped being the salt in those areas that need salt. And then they complain that there's, no, there's, there's only death, there's only, there's only evil. You know, it's multiplying, it's growing, it's increasing. Yeah, because there's no salt there. There's nothing there to stop it. There's nothing there to stop the death. There's nothing there to stop the, the wickedness, the evil. Jesus said that salt is for the manure pile. If, if you don't deal with waste, if you don't deal with that stuff, guess what's going to happen? It's going gonna, it's gonna to bring sickness and disease and death. And in the same way, if there is no salt in the earth, in those places where evil are prone to grow, then it's going to just grow. It's going to spring up because there's nothing to stop it. And Jesus, and you know, the scripture tells us in Thessalonians, it tells us that the church is what prevents evil from breaking loose on the earth. You know, we, we know that the Bible says that he that letteth will let until, they, until he's removed. And then that man of sin will be revealed. People believe that the Antichrist, you know, I've mentioned this before. People believe that the Antichrist, oh, the, that's, that person's the Antichrist. That person's the Antichrist. There ain't no Antichrist. You don't know who the Antichrist is. Because at least you, you may find out later, but I know I won't because when the Antichrist is here, I'm going to be gone. I'm not going to be here. You got these people running around saying, well, this person is the anti, that person's the, I've heard every president of the United States, every president that gets elected, you got a group of people in the state saying, that's the Antichrist. I'm serious. When Barack Obama, that's the Antichrist. When Trump, that's the Antichrist. Every president, that's the Antichrist. No, it's not the Antichrist. The Bible says that we will be removed. Then that man of sin will be revealed. Right? So wh why can't he be revealed now? Why can't iniquity break loose now? Why can't the devil have his way and run rampant in the earth now? Because the salt is still on the earth. You're here. And the church doesn't understand who they are. They don't understand how much power they have. And so when they don't understand how much power they have, they pull back. They say, oh, there's evil over there. Instead of taking the salt and spreading it all over the evil and making their presence known, they retreat back and then they, call, they allow that evil to grow and mass produce. When God said, you're the salt, you're the ones on the earth that's there to prevent that stuff from breaking out. That's why you see what's going on right now in the U.S. going on. I mean, it's crazy right now. People can't even define what a woman is. Oh, a woman is whatever you want a, woman, a person to be. What is a woman? Well, whatever you want to be. They can't even say what it is. I'm talking about presidents and, and politicians. They won't even define what a, what a woman is. 
is crazy. And, and a part of that is because in some areas, the church is, is, is pedaled back, is moved back. And it's not gone into those areas because, you know, and I'm going to get into it in a minute, but they don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to be the salt because salt causes things to stand out. It has an effect, right? It has an effect. Salt was used to be a disinfectant. The believers, the believer, us here on the earth, we're, we're, Jesus means for us to be disinfectants to wickedness on the earth. You have to see that. that that's why God put you in that job. You know, there, there are many Christians that say, well, I wish I was working in a Christian job or I wish I was working in a, you know, a Christian uh, where, where a lot of Christians were. You know, I, I, and, and, and there was an example where a guy was, he was talking, to, uh, a lady came up to him, there's another pastor, a lady came up to him and said, Pastor, I've been praying that the Lord would give me a job. She worked at a law firm, at a Christian law firm because I'm around so many sinners and, you know, people, you know, talking about wicked, wicked things that just grieves my spirit. And, you know, they up, that these things upset me. And I've been believing God that he would get me a job at a Christian law firm. And he got me a job. And the pastor said to her, I'm so sad. Because if you're the only Christian there and you're leaving, now there's no salt. There's no salt. And the reason why she had that attitude was because she didn't see who she was. You see, she wanted to retreat from the wickedness because she didn't understand that it was her responsibility to have an effect on those that were there. And you got many Christians like that. You got many Christians that I know Christians that would go from job to job because of what was going on. And they were so spiritually, they were in such unbelief and so spiritually weak that they couldn't even, they were like, man, this is affecting me so much. It's oppressing me. I can't be around these people. These people are so wicked and so vile. I can't be around these people. And they leave their job. You, you got to understand who you are. God put you out there so that you can have a, an impact on the world around you. So that you can be the disinfectant. How, do you dis, how, do you, how, how does that happen? By your standard of righteousness. By the standard of righteousness that God has called us to. When you, when you the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, it says that we are to shine like stars in the night guiding the lost. How do we do that? By our standard of righteousness. That I don't talk like the world. I don't act like the world. I don't, when you, when you look at the way I do things and you look at the way the wicked does things, it's two different things. Two different things. Two different ways. We don't act the same. We don't talk the same. You, you, can, you, can, you can steal and you can lie and you can cheat to get what you want. But as a believer, as a son or daughter of God, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be upfront with you. I'm going to be truthful with you. I'm going to be moral with you because I'm the salt of the earth. And when the world sees, they see you're going to stand out. They're going to either hate you or they're going to love you. They're going to say, man, I mean, I really appreciate that. Or they're going to say, oh, get away from me. I don't want, I don't want anything to do with you. And that's why Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Because he knew when you're going to be, when you choose to be salt, you know, some people aren't going to like you. Some people aren't going to, I don't want it, I don't want no disinfectant in here. I want to, I want, I want it to be stinking here. I want it to be dirty in here. I want it to be germsy in here. That's what the world is like to God. I want it to be foul. No, we come to bring life. We come to disinfect, disinfect. You, you want to, you, he, and, and the pastor said to that lady, he said, what you should have done was you should have prayed and asked God to send more believers to your job. That's what you should, your prayer should have been. Instead of praying for a Christian to go to a Christian job, you should have believed God to send more Christians to your job so you can have a greater impact. You are the salt of the earth. Wherever we go, we have to understand that God, that's what, do you know why, why Jesus left you here? Why he left me here? And he didn't, when you get saved, you know, he didn't just zoom you away and beam you up to heaven. You know why? Because he wants you to affect the world. That's why when you said Jesus, you know, I believe in you. I, you know, I believe that you're my savior. Then you didn't get beamed away. Like they do on Star Trek. So we got another one. Beam him, beam him up. Beam him up, Scotty. Beam him up. We got another one. That's why you didn't get beamed away. Because you have a mission. 
in everything that you do. We do, we work, we live, we, we, we go through trials just like the world. But the, what, what impacts the world is that when we live life, they look at us and they see that, man, they're going through this differently. They're going through this in a whole different way than I go through this. And you stand out among them and they see the good, they see your father. And they, the Bible says they'll glorify your father because of your good works. And if they don't do it now, the Bible says they'll do it when he returns. Because you didn't go with them and do the things that they do and, the, and act the way that they act. The Bible says that they'll glorify God because of you. Because of you being the salt. Jesus is telling us in this scripture that we are the people who will stop bad things from growing and spreading and promote good things to grow and spread. When he tells us that we are the salt that goes on the, you know, salt of the earth and the salt for the dunghill. He's telling us you prevent evil from springing forth and you also promote life and growth. That's how you have to look at yourself. This is, and the, let me tell you something, tell you a secret. Guess what? The devil knows that you're the salt. Unfortunately, many Christians don't, or they don't believe it. The devil knows more about the impact that you can have on the world than most Christians, than, than most Christians know. He knows, what, he knows what you are. He knows the impact that you can have if you just believe the word of God about you and believe what Jesus said. He knows. If this person really believes, he, right now, he's shaking right now. Because some of you, you're hearing this for the first time or you're rehearing it and you're believing this and he's shaking. He's like, oh no, I don't want them to hear that. I don't want them to hear that. I don't want them to know that. I don't want them to know the power that they have to affect those around them. I don't want them, shh, that's supposed to be a secret. That's what he thinks about this. You have power to affect change. We're the salt not because of what we say or do, but just because of what we are. Salt has such a great effect because it is totally different from its environment. Whatever you put salt on, it has an effect on the environment. Salt is needed in a certain amount. You can't just have a little bit. That's why that lady should have, if she, if she didn't feel like she was adequate, adequate, she should have prayed, Lord, bring more believers. You need a certain amount. You need as much as really you can get. You know, in the kitchen, only a little bit of salt is needed to have an impact on a dish or food that you're making. But as a fertilizer or disinfectant, you need piles of salt. You need a lot of it. You, you, don't, you know, when they use uh, salt to fertilize the ground, they, they couldn't just sprinkle it on the ground. You needed a lot, a lot more to be fertilizer or to be used as fertilizer or to be used as disinfectant. They would use handfuls of salt. You need a lot to bring about an affecting, uh, affecting change. And the concept of being salt in society demands a certain proportion of society being salt. And I, and I talked about this earlier. That's why you see certain trends. It's not that we don't have enough salt. The world has enough salt to make a change. Just that, you know, the, where the salt is needed the most is where it's not, it's not at. You know, I, I remember hearing, you know, Christians say, oh, you know, as soon as it gets 6 o'clock, you know, that's it. I'm not going out. I'm not doing any. I'm not, you know, I want to be in the street. It's like, okay, so you just basically let the darkness take over then. You know, let the darkness take over. No, we have to see who we are. We have to believe who we are and what we are. When you, when you don't let this, when the salt is not spread out where it's needed, then society starts to decay and becomes corrupt. Salt has to be in direct contact with the situation in which it is needed. Like I said earlier, you can't just keep it in the box. It's, not, it's no good. You say, oh, I'm salt. I got plenty of salt. Yeah, but you're not pouring it out on anything. It's, it's good for nothing. You, it needs to be poured out. And then salt 
needs to be of a certain quality. It has to be salty. Now, Jesus said something very strange. I don't know if you caught it, but he said, listen, let's go back to Luke. Listen to what Jesus said. He says in verse 34, salt is good, but if, if salt has lost its taste or its saltiness, how shall it saltiness be restored? That's strange because... Jesus isn't making stuff up. Jesus said that salt could lose its saltiness, but we, we know salt doesn't lose its saltiness. So what does Jesus mean when he says if the salt loses its saltiness, right? How can salt lose its saltiness? How is that possible? Salt can't just all of a sudden one day stop. Even if it's, you've set it out, if you set salt out, you know, on the counter or the table and it sat out, it sat in that box for years, even if it got all wet and clumped up and whatever, it's, you, if you taste it, it's still going to be salty. It may taste like some other things too, but it's going to be salty. So he says, if the salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing to be what? Except to be what? Thrown out on the street. Now, that's how they threw out their trash back in the day. They didn't have trash cans. You know, they didn't have garbage collectors. So what they would do is they would all of their trash would be thrown out on the street, and he's saying that salt that has no saltiness is good for nothing but to be thrown out on the street because it has no use. It has no, it has no use. But the question is, how does something that, like salt, lose its saltiness? Salt can't really change because it is what it is. So how does it lose its saltiness? Well, the only way that salt can lose its saltiness is when it is, well, let me give you an example. This is what the merchants in Israel would do. Because, you know, people, some people, you know, even in Israel, you got wicked people, man. What they would do was, when they would, when they would go and, and collect the salt that they had, they would mix it with sand, a certain amount of sand. And so when, when they would sell it, the, you, had, you had people that would sell low quality and high quality but you had some people that were schemers, you know. And so they would sell low-quality salt as if it was high-quality salt. What made it low-quality was that they would, it would have sand in it. And they left sand in it on purpose because they would weigh it. They would sell it by weight. And so they would, say, they would sell the sand, uh, salt that was not pure salt, but it was mixed with sand so that when you used it, it wouldn't obviously be as salty, the amount that you poured on whatever you were using it for, say you were using it for fertilizer, or you were using it on the dung hill, it wouldn't have the effect that it was meant to have because it was mixed with some other substance. And that was the only way that salt could lose its saltiness. So when Jesus said, if the salt loses its saltiness, what he meant was, the only way that a believer can, can, can lose their impact on the world is if they're mixed with the world, right? When I'm not purely what I'm supposed to be. When there is something in me that is of the world, I'm not going to have the potency that God intended for me to have. So when I'm in and amongst the world, I'm not going to stir the world up. They're not going to notice me. That my morality is not going to stand out to them because I'm mixed up with something else. There's other stuff in my life that prevents me from being as potent as God wanted me to be so that I can have an impact, right? And that's why the Bible tells us to be careful of the world. Don't love the world. And this is one of the things that the church has done. You see... Lots and lots of lots of churches and Christian organizations, what they've done was they've tried to become acceptable to the world. And when the church tries to become acceptable to the world so that the world would come to the church, they don't understand that they're not changing the world. The world is changing them. When you try to change for the world so that the world would accept you, you're not changing the world. The world's changing you. Somebody said that, you know, a lifeboat it's only good on the water as long as the water doesn't fill the lifeboat. Do you understand what that means? A lifeboat is put on the water to save you, right? From drowning in the water. But if water gets in the lifeboat, the lifeboat is no good. 
And what that means is we who are the salt of the earth, we're meant to save those in the earth and prevent evil and wicked from spreading. But if the water gets in, my, in me, right, I'm no longer a lifeboat. I'm no longer able to do what I was put here to do. Now I'm useless. Now I'm going to go under. And that's the way many people are. And many people in, in Christian circles, they teach that, oh, we, we want to be like the world. We want to be socially acceptable to the world, right? We want to accept what the world accepts. We want to act like the world does. Oh, you know, the Lord said this about those things, but we want to ex be accepting to the world. So we're not going to really talk about those things. Or we're not, we're not going to speak about them the way the Lord spoke about them. We're going to accept all of that so that we can bring the people in. But now, the, the church is now the world. It's not the church anymore. And you thought you were winning the world, but the world was filling you up with water. You're supposed to be the lifeboat. And that's, that's what many religious organizations have become. They become worldly. And so the way we prevent that is by not allowing the world to take control of us. Not getting so much of the world in us that we're no longer having a potent effect on those around us. The Bible says, awake to righteousness, rise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. It says, awake, rise up, rise up, and if we're not careful, we can fall asleep, fall asleep, fall with the sleep of the world. We listen to the tune of the world and we fall asleep by its lullaby, and we don't have any power and effect on the world, but it affects us. And we still bear the name Christian. We still bear the name religious. You got churches and whole denominations right now that says that, hey, it's okay to be married. Uh, a man can marry a man. A woman can marry a woman. The pastor can marry, a, you know, his husband or, and, and she can marry her wife. You got whole denominations right now that are saying that. When you bring up the word of God, they said, but, but that was, you know, that was more of, of the past. That was more fundamental those are the hardline Christians, but into, this is what they say. I've heard it many, many times. But in today's world, we, we are open to the way that the world sees things. I'm talking about church leaders. We, we want to be ex culturally acceptable to the world. And we understand that because the culture and the world has changed, we're no longer holding on to those old things. When those old things are from the old or the ancient one who spoke those words that are standing today, his word doesn't change. Those, old thi those things that they call old things or old ways came out of the mouth of God. And the Bible says that heaven and earth will pass away, but not one word of his mouth will ever fade. And, they, and, they, and they, they act as though the words of the eternal God that are eternal, eternally settled in the heaven can be changed based on the whims and the ebbs and flows of the culture of, of this world that we live in. And it never will. God's, God's standard never changes with the world. That's what causes us to stand out. That's what causes us to be salty. Because He doesn't change. And you have people... They're, they're, they've lost their saltiness because they've allowed and accepted the world to come and dilute them. And now they don't even look like the salt. They don't taste like the salt. They don't have the power that the salt has. They've lost their saltiness, their effect to bring change. And when you talk to them about things like this, they, they become your enemy. They, they literally will fight against you. And Jesus called, and Jesus called, you said, well, how can we live to the standard? I mean, because you know, you understand that what I read last week in the Beatitudes, you can't live that standard. I can't live that standard in and of myself. I can only live that standard as a supernatural, by, by supernatural means. I can't rejoice when I'm being uh, persecuted in and of myself. I can't be glad when I suffer for righteousness sake in and of my, how do I do that? I have to have something supernatural from God if I'm going to actually do that. If I don't have something from God above and beyond what people have, I can't do the things that Jesus did. And then you, that same church that's, that's, that's diluted, that's lost its saltiness, what they, what they do instead is that they, they allow the world to affect them because they don't live the supernatural life of the believer. They live the natural life because that's, that's what happens when you allow the world into the church. Then you no longer have the supernatural power of God at work in the lives of his people. And so when you read the words of Jesus and say, love your enemies, 
You, 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 you go into those churches where people suck it. I don't know about that. I, I ain't loving that person. I've been in many places where I've literally heard the pastor share what God said out of his own word, and I've seen them cut their eye and suck their teeth and say, I ain't doing that, and twist their neck. And they didn't understand that they were speaking against not the pastor, they were speaking against God. But the reason why they would say that is because they don't understand the supernatural power that Jesus Christ makes available to us. Do you know that Jesus' standard is higher than any other standard that any other philosopher, teacher, prophet, or religious person in the world ever brought? Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them. That use you. You know, many Christians, because they don't believe in this supernatural life, when they read those words of Jesus, they ignore them totally. Because they don't actually believe that they have what it takes to do it. Because they're looking at the natural life. They're not looking at the supernatural life that God made available to it. And, and when you go to Matthew chapter 6, in the same teaching, when Jesus says, don't worry about your life, that's another one of those teachings that people feel impossible. What does he mean, don't worry about it? Let me just ignore that. Because, you know, I know Jesus said that, but that's, that's, that's what we're to, we're to, you know, we're to, we're to wish and hope that we could not worry about our lives. But I hear Christians say, I'm worried, I'm stressed all the time. Well, as long as you say that, that's what you're going to have. Because my wife will tell you right now, whatever situation, trial, or tribulation that we've been through in life, she'll tell you that I don't walk in it and worry. And it's not because I'm great. It's not because I'm better than anybody else. It's not because my faith is greater. It's just because I believe Jesus is my teacher. And if he teaches me that this is who I am and this is what I can do, I just believe him. It's that simple. I, I believe him. And many people complicate it because they're looking at themselves. Remember, this whole series is about looking unto Jesus. We started in 2 Corinthians. What, about, what did it say? When one turns to the Lord. And people are so busy looking at themselves that they don't look at Jesus and what he's done for them. And so they see their own weaknesses and say, man, I can't be that. I can't do that. I can't love my enemy. I can't do good. He didn't just say, say good. He didn't say, ignore those that persecute you, ignore, ignore, he didn't say ignore them, he didn't say just pretend that they didn't do it and walk, he said do good to them, he's literally telling you to do something good for them, and to them, right, so you, you want to make sure that you're hearing and you're believing that Jesus, that you are who he said you are, you are the salt of the earth, you are the salt of the earth, you don't try to be, you are, and if you don't believe that, you're not going to act like it. You're not going to go out with confidence, not in yourself, but in God, and believe that because God is with you, and because you have a, now because God is with you, you have a supernatural life, because a lot of Christians don't believe that they have a supernatural life. If you don't have a supernatural life, then God is not living in you. How can God Almighty live in you and you have a normal life? I don't understand that. Now, religious people like to say, oh, the God who has given us of His Spirit that dwelleth within our hearts. They talk nonsense, but they don't believe that. From the day that I, I understood that the Holy Spirit of God Almighty lives in me, I believe that my life is not natural. How can I have a natural life if the living God abides within me? How can you have a natural life if you believe that the living God abides within you, you cannot. You cannot have it. And so believe. Believe that you're the salt. Two things that I want to share, and then we're going to wrap it up, about being the light. Not only are we the salt of the earth, but Jesus said that you are the light of the world. And just, just as salt has an effect in the earth to bring and produce life, and it also puts down death, light has a negative and a positive effect as well, right? Light has a negative and a positive effect as well, both for good, but negative and positive. The negative aspect of light is that light exposes the bad ways or the unrighteousness of men. Now, this is what Jesus said, right? Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Not, 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 shot, not act like that. You see, you are the light. So when you're the light, what, what's going to happen? You're going to expose the bad deeds of men. Right? Because you are the light. So wherever you go, where people are doing wickedness, it's going to be exposed. 
It's going to be exposed if you're the light. He says, it says, so light exposes the, 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 uh, the, the, the bad ways or the unrighteousness of men. And then light, the positive aspect of light is that light shows us a better way. So it not only shows you the bad, it shows you the way. It not only shows you what's wrong with you, it shows you the way to get right. Right? That's what happens in salvation, our conversion experience. When I got saved, God showed me my sin, but he also showed me Jesus is the way to be free from it. Right? So when we're light, we expose darkness, and, but we also show the way. Right? And sometimes people don't like either. They don't like you to expose the darkness, and they don't like you to, when you show them the way. They also, I, don't, I don't need the way. I don't need the way. I'm, I got my own way. And they're in darkness. They're in darkness. When people say, well, I want to do my, I can do my own thing. I'll go my, I can go my own way. You, you're, they're in trouble because you, you don't know. God, God is the light. Jesus said, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. So if you don't have, let me tell you, Revelation, if you don't know God, if you don't have God, you're in darkness. If you're not following God, you're in darkness. It's that simple. You can have the clearest plan for your life. You can have every step that you're going to take. But if you don't know God, you're in darkness. And so our job as believers is to show the world, expose the darkness that they're in so that they can see their need for the light. Light doesn't only expose darkness, but it shows us the way. What, is, what does it say in Psalm 119? Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You're the light of the world. You can show people the way. And without you, to be honest, the world would be, listen, people, listen, I mean, we're not where we should be, I think, universally in the church, but I believe that if we, if, if we weren't here, the world would be a whole lot worse. It would be a whole lot worse. Because the Bible says we're the light of the world. The world would be in darkness, complete darkness and sin. There would be nothing to tell the world but to hold it back. That's what Jesus says that we are. We are the salt and we are the light. The only action that Jesus commands us to do is the light is to what? He says, put yourself on the stand so that it can light wherever you are. That means don't hide. Don't hide the light. Don't pretend, oh, well, you know, I, I don't want to shine Jesus because that person might not like me. The Bible, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And you know that. Oh, I don't want to put my light on the stand because somebody might get, their deeds might be exposed and they may not like you. Who cares if they like you? God likes you. Jesus likes you. At the end of the day, they're going to wish that they listened to you. They're going to wish that they saw your light so at least they would have had an opportunity to turn to it. They're going to wish that. Who cares what they think? That's what he calls us to be. He calls us to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's who we are as believers. You know, Jesus is our teacher. And in this, you know, in this message, he's, he's telling us, I want you to know what you are so that you can know what your job is. Because a lot of Christians don't know. You're here more than anything else, to be a representative of God. The Bible says we are ambassadors. Not to, an ambassador is not just the apostle, you know, who, who's, who's got many, many churches. Yes, they are ambassadors, but there is, every believer is an ambassador. You carry Christ wherever you go. That's who you are today. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Hallelujah. Come on, just stand to your feet.